Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, and, and thank you for those of you in the audience who also put a tie on, because otherwise it's just games and me tonight. So uh, thanks, Richard, <laughs> for joining us. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, well, the inaugural uh, Gidea Alumni Lecture. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here, and I very much hope that you enjoy this evening's uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Robert Vanderlord, I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor at the University, and uh, I will introduce James, and I will also take and chair the questions uh, thereafter. But so I, I will, in, in, in a good practice, now if nobody puts their hand up for any questions, I will just select a few of you, so <laughs> just be careful of that. So uh, thank you for coming, thank you for those of you alumni, students, staff, and also thank you for those who follow the uh, lecture tonight online. Uh, past experience says that often we have many more people online following the lecture than are actually in the audience. Um, so, so be aware, when we ask you the questions later, wait for the microphone so people can follow it. Right, that were the, the former kind of introductions. So it is my great honor then to introduce our guest speaker of the evening, uh, James Dean. So James is Director of Policy and Research at BBC Media Action, which is the BBC's international development charity. James has spent more than 30 years supporting media and communication initi initiatives that improve the, uh, democratic governance and saves lives. Most of his professional work is focused on the role of media and access to information in development. He spent 20 years at the Panos Institute, an NGO working to ensure that information was used to foster debate, pluralism and democracy. His work has been to inform people and create platforms for debate and dialogue. He continues to work on the catalytic role of media and communications in development, which can inspire people to make changes in their lives. He is the author and commissioner of numerous reports on the role of media and communication in shaping development outcomes, including contributions to global policy making forums in the development of communication, HIV and AIDS communication, and media and development. Now, James' talk this evening is entitled From HIV to Climate Adaptation. And he will draw on his wealth of experience and expertise to explore how social and behavioural change communication has evolved over more than three decades. So after James' talk, there will be opportunities to ask questions from the floor. And I have no doubt that you will find James' uh, talk fascinating tonight. And so please welcome, uh, well, join me in welcoming James as our special lecture tonight. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice-Chancellor, um, and also to Sarah Cardi um, for um, inviting me. It genuinely is a, a huge honour um, to be giving this um, uh, lecture, and I hadn't realised until just now it was the inaugural lecture, so even more of an honour. So thank you um, very much. I hope to do three things this evening. Um, I want to provide a bit of history of um, how communication has been used and sometimes misused. Um, in addressing development challenges, and I'm especially going to draw on the early history of HIV-AIDS in that respect. Um, I want to ask what, if any, lessons were drawn from such experiences, and I want to look at how past lessons learned are informing the opportunities and challenges facing the field of communication with development now, including for other issues like climate adaptation. I'd like to start by dedicating this lecture to someone I used to work with many years ago. Um, her name was Renee Sabatier. She is someone who never received the recognition she deserved. And I want to start by explaining why this is so and why I want to do this. So I started working in this field 35 years ago. It feels a very long time. Um, um, in 1984, when I joined as a very junior administrative assistant, an organization called EarthScan. EarthScan was started by a guy called John Tinker, um, who has very good claim to being the first environmental journalist in the world. He was working in the late 1960s with New Scientist magazine. Nestled within and established by the International Institute for Environment and Development, uh, EarthScan's aim was to use really good journalism to bring to public attention, especially within what was then called the third world, and especially through the media, what it termed neglected or poorly understood issues. 
Some of those issues were both prescient, prescient and fascinating. My first job was actually marketing a report published in 1983 called Carbon Dioxide, Climate and Mankind. Others were frankly less interesting and required some creativity to bring to life. Another report I was asked to, to promote was called Stoves and Trees. Um, but its subtitle was how much wood would a wood stove save if a wood stove could save wood? <laughs> and that was kind of summed up the character of what Erskan was trying to do. And that subtitle got it a review in the Times. Um, Erskan ran what it called a news feature service, publishing stories from developing countries written mainly by developing country journalists on key issues of development concern. And Rene was the editor of that service. But around 1984, her journalistic antennae became increasingly focused on an issue that at that time was seen almost entirely as one facing industrialized countries, and especially the US. A virus then known as the human T lymphotropic virus, or HTLV3, or as it was known for a time, <coughs> GRID, the gay-related immunodeficiency virus, and was of course later officially named as the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. The more Renee looked into this issue, the more she became convinced that this virus was having a devastating effect on developing countries. Now, for reasons too tedious to go into, Erskan at the time collapsed and was reborn as the Panos Institute, with some of the same staff members moving over, including Renee, and I moved over too. And Renee convinced her boss, John Tinker, to take the issue seriously, and he managed to convince the Norwegian Red Cross to fund a report researched and written by René, entitled AIDS in the Third World. And, let me, and that's kind of what it looked like. And this was the first reasonably comprehensive analysis and documentation, certainly for public audience, of the devastation HIV was wreaking, especially in Africa at the time. That report was published in, an, in early 1986 and quite heavily covered by the media of the time. Panos then organized the first donors meeting on the issue, held in a beautiful French abbey in Talwa, France, quite close to Geneva. That was attended by the heads of UNICEF, Jim Grant, and WHO, Halfton Mahler, at the time, as well as other development agencies. And it created the first real funding available to tackle HIV, including HIV, especially HIV prevention in developing countries. And then Rene did something that I consider in retrospect, utterly extraordinary. She understood right from the start that the spread of HIV was fundamentally a social pandemic. It was a virus for not only spread where poverty was most acute and existing health services were most weak, but where stigma, prejudice and discrimination abounded. As well as producing three editions of AIDS in the Third World, she wrote this report, Blaming Others. Prejudice, Race and Worldwide AIDS, published in 1988. And that report was followed later by this one, Triple Jeopardy, Women and AIDS, written by her colleague, Judy Mariassi, and produced in cooperation with the Society for Women and AIDS in Africa. This is a kind of back cover blurb, blurb, and you can see what it was talking about. HIV and AIDS threaten the women in three ways. She may become infected with HIV herself and may then develop AIDS, if she is HIV positive, she may pass this infection to her baby uh, in the womb. Uh, because women are the main uh, carers for the sick, she will carry um, the burden if, um, uh, uh, if, her child, if someone else um, goes on to develop AIDS. How can she protect herself from this triple jeopardy? In nearly all societies, women are disadvantaged economically and socially. Many lack effective control over their own lives and are unable to protect themselves against infection. So this report came from uh, Judy, it was very much informed by the analysis that Renee made right from the start of her analysis of the HIV pandemic. And that in turn was followed by other reports, and I'm not going to go through them all, but heavily influenced and informed by Renee's initial analysis, including um, this one on AIDS and men, a subtitle Taking Risks or Taking Responsibility, very much focused on the responsibilities of men. The Hidden Epidemic, documenting the cost to development of the emerging HIV crisis and the repercussions of a fear of AIDS. And these were written by uh, someone called Martin Foreman. 
Now, nearly all of these attracted significant or substantial media coverage at the time and helped inform the international response, including the early response from the World Health Organization, who in 1986 had set up the global program on AIDS, inspired by and under the wonderful leadership of Dr. Jonathan Mann, who greatly valued the work Panos was doing. John Mann actually resigned from WHO in 1990 because he felt the organization was not prioritizing the response to the epidemic seriously enough and especially not taking into account the human, human rights dimensions of the pandemic. Rene Sabatier died tragically young, um, a little over 15 years ago, but in Zambia, and actually, incidentally, so did John Mann in a Swiss airplane crash in 1998. And I think the loss of both of them has been extremely tragic for the way in which this epidemic has progressed. So why is this reminiscence from more than 30 years ago relevant now. Well, during this time, we witnessed this. An epidemic by which, by the best estimates of a time in 1984, was probably infecting around 4 million people around the world. During the time that I and others at Panos worked on this issue, until around 2001, when AZT, the beginnings of com and when other antiretroviral and combination therapies became reasonably widely available and affordable, we saw the virus infect 30 million people. An effective global response to HIV only really began to take shape thanks to the work of Treatment Action Group, and that's why I flagged this one in 1998, Treatment Action Campaign. Um, I'm a tireless and intensive advocacy of people with HIV and AIDS. I later became the head of the AIDS program, HIV AIDS program at PANOS. And throughout this decade and a half, there were a lot of things that we understood that could be done to spread the um, HIV. A lot of them were effectively under the, um, in the domain of, of health authorities, protect blood, blood supplies, avoid infections and medical operations, and so on. But mainly, the, the main protection to this virus was communication. Getting people to understand they were at risk and providing the information, the means, mainly in the form of using a condom during sex, and above all, the agency, the confidence to enable them to protect themselves. And we failed. We failed catastrophically. Millions of people became infected with HIV, in my view, unnecessarily, because human beings catastrophically failed to communicate with each other. In 2001, Panos co-convened a meeting under the auspices of what was then called the United Nations Communication for Development Roundtable in Nicaragua. That meeting, organized with the UN Fund for Population Activities, UNFPA, and the Rockefeller Foundation, acknowledged the failure and set out the reasons why we had failed so badly. And principal among them were the issues that René had raised in 1988. But it was not enough to convey knowledge, to send out messages, to market condoms, and especially it was not enough to focus on individuals and the expectation that they would change their behavior. This was an epidemic that required shifts in power, especially between women and men, between wives and husbands, sex workers and clients, between people who had no money and people who did. It required shifts between those who had no power to negotiate the terms on which they had sex and those who did have that power. It was an epidemic that thrived on blame, on stigma, on discrimination, and no amount of condom promotion or messaging would work unless those underlying social norms and societal structures were addressed at the same time. Communication needed to be at the heart of the response to HIV, but it needed to be the right kind of communication. This is how that report summarized the learnings from that experience in Nicaragua. The lessons and experience shared at the meeting revealed a growing sense of frustration from the south and the north over the shortfalls of existing approaches. There was a strong feeling that HIV AIDS communication, while sometimes highly effective and participatory, is too often donor-led, narrowly focused, short-term, and uncoordinated, favoring quick fix solutions rather than deep-seated social change needed to turn around the epidemic. Many participants, and I should stress this, came from lots of donors, a whole range of donor meet, donors at the meeting, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNFPA, um, a lot of organizations from the South and many others. 
um, uh, many participants pointed out that informed public debate, a robust civil society response to HIV, and other horizontal efforts that often, uh, often take too often take second place to externally conceived and vertically imposed processes. A combination of complementary communication approaches was required, with participation in community empowerment <coughs> being the um, uh, enduring motifs. I mean, it said this, and I'll not read all of that out. But recognizing this scenario, the Communication for Development Roundtable believes the following. The HIV AIDS pandemic presents unique and unresolved challenges for communication for development. <coughs> the continuing absence of a cure and a vaccine for HIV AIDS, the capacity of people to communicate with each other is a critical part of containing the epidemic. Despite the success noted above, existing HIV AIDS communication interventions have proved inadequate in containing and mitigating the effects of the epidemic. They have too often treated people as objects of change, rather than as agents of their own change, focused exclusively on a few individual behaviours, rather than also addressing social norms, policy, cultures, and supportive environments, conveyed information from technical experts, rather than sensitively placing accurate information into dialogue and debate, try to persuade people to do something, rather than negotiate the best forward for, way forward in the <coughs> partnership process. That was in 2001, that's nearly 20 years ago. We published our own report reiterating that experience and we called it Missing the Message. Um, and the reason we called it that, is because if experience had taught us anything, it was that messaging on its own does not achieve change when the development issue is as complex as HIV. There were organizations who understood this and did astonishingly impactful work um, on preventing HIV. Um, I'll mention one, Soul City in South Africa, now called the Soul City Institute for Social Justice, went on to develop hugely popular TV drama and connected and allied into communication interventions, which recognized these issues and tackled them, for example, by making a remarkable impact in tackling domestic violence in South Africa. They understood that behavior change around HIV ultimately required deep seat social change. They also understood that successful interventions were rooted in a strong understanding of political and social context and really good research into information and communication needs and realities of people most affected by the issue. A 2008 Johns Hopkins research study found that the practice of HIV prevention behaviors averted some 700,000 cases of HIV in South Africa by 2005, at a time when treating this many people with antiretroviral therapy for just a year would at least at that time have cost more than $280 million. Soul City is widely credited with being the most effective organization in the country doing this kind of effort. It's just one example of these kinds of successes, but the problem with much of a development system, and certainly I think much of our approach to the HIV pandemic, is that we never actually acknowledged the failure. When did the international system actually carry out the kind of forensic, detailed, international inquiry into how such a catastrophic epidemic was ever allowed to become the pandemic it did? What could we learn from such a failure? How might we prevent something like it ever happening again? The development system is really poor at really interrogating why development fails. HIV is the most dramatic example I know of this. When panels started working on HIV, when I started working on HIV, there was pretty well no, at least almost no, monitorable HIV in Zimbabwe. More than a fifth of 15 to 49 year olds later became infected with the virus. There was little or no HIV in Southern Africa full stop. By 2005, Zimbabwe, between 2000 and 2005, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland and Lesotho had lost respectively 35, 28, 28 and 24 years of life expectancy. To the extent that there are histories of HIV AIDS, most focus on the emerging epidemic in the West and on the search for an effective treatment. Only rarely do they focus on the challenge of prevention and even more rarely focus on the role of human communication. That I think explains why pioneers like René Sabatier are now largely forgotten. And there are costs to that forgetfulness. One of those costs was a lack of preparedness for the next epidemic or challenge that raised similar issues of inequality and social complexity. 
Well, of course, how likely was it that another virus would come along which created such fear, thrived on stigma and discrimination, that was communicable through bodily fluids, including sex, or the ritual cleansing of bodies after death? Unfortunately, when Ebola struck, the public health system did not have the lessons of HIV or the other systems necessary for an effective communication response really and readily available to it, because I think those lessons had never really been learned by the public health system. Bad communication made the, epidemic, made the Ebola epidemic worse. It took months for the importance of communication to be learned. And as one of the te epidemics we interviewed for this report, a panel, uh, a BBC media, oh, sorry, no, I don't want to do that. Something's gone wrong with my slides. It doesn't really matter. Um, uh, but um, as one of the medics we interviewed um, for a report BBC Media Action um, uh, produced called Coming of Age um, uh, on the role of communication in public health outcomes, um, uh, one of the people we interviewed who was working for Médecins Sans Frontières, she said, we kept asking for more hospital beds and we kept getting more hospital beds. What we should have been asking for was more sensitization activities. And the most effective communication responses were informed by the same kind of analysis that Rene had made in the 1980s, by communicating messages to people who lived in fear of a terrifying disease without enabling them to take their own actions and make their own decisions and find ways of separating fear of a disease from fear of a person with a disease would not work. Our own approach at BBC Media Action, where I now work, focused not simply on informing, but finding ways to communicate that enable people to make their own plans and take the issue into their own hands. It is why the program we developed ended up being called Mr. Plan Plan. And I just want to show, show a short video of how those kind of ideas incorpor got to incorporate it into practice in one real life experience of a response in Sierra Leone. Cases are rising sharply. The actual number is thought to be much higher than that. The Ebola has now reached nearly 7,000. The situation 000. is getting out of control. And by December, cases have topped 17,000. Now we are at 21,000 cases and over 8,000 deaths. This is the worst Ebola outbreak that the world has ever seen. As BBC Media Action, we can't wait for things to happen. Fear, misunderstanding and rumours about Ebola have all helped spread this virus. There were rumours about what Ebola is. An Ebola plane coming down. Children were being given chlorine. Medics who were coming into communities were bringing Ebola with them. A lot of misinformation which was not helping contain the outbreak. And others just bluntly deny that Ebola exists. We don't have any Ebola here, this man told me. I don't know what is killing all these people, but Ebola is not real. We knew that without better information, necessary changes in behavior would not take place. We started producing programs telling Sierra Leoneans what to do and what not to do to stay safe. Talking to local and religious leaders, health organizations that are working on the ground. Public service announcements. Musicians would sing songs about Ebola. Traditional funerals where loved ones washed infected bodies became key breeding grounds for the virus. As Sierra Leoneans, we believe that we must say goodbye to our family. They died. Cry, you touch them, you give them messages that they will take to your ancestors. This Ebola outbreak has completely drawn a line on that. The next moment, the Ebola burial team would be around to bury them. Now, nobody can actually pay the last respect to the dead. So it was tough to bring together all these ideas and actually sell to the people that this is what Ebola is. This is the situation that we now live in as Sierra Leoneans. I had a friend who was directly affected by the outbreak. I mean, this is a real good friend, you know, and he has been doing his bit. He has his Twitter account, this is what Ebola is, and he just died of the disease that he's been talking about. These are trying times we sacrifice. We decided to develop a drama for Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. 
Mr. Plan Plan and the people where every episode mimics making those difficult decisions about a person they love who might be infected with the Ebola virus. BBC Media Action creative directors, scriptwriters and actors from all over the world recounted their personal stories and their desire to help their communities. <laughs> You can. Listeners are tuning in every day because they want to know what happens, calling in with their stories, which are very similar to what they're hearing in the drama. So it's clearly resonating on an emotional level with people, which is exactly what we hoped would happen. Mr. Plan Plan, coming to your radio station. Predictions are looking at this continuing well into 2015. We are covering stories of survivors who are rejected by their communities of children who are orphaned by Ebola and nobody wants to take care of, and of the complete lack of basic health services, especially for pregnant women. In some regions right now, to be a pregnant woman is a death sentence. I want to see my country stand tall again without having to worry about touching my friend. I want to see my family members go back to school. I want all the dead infrastructure come back to life. I mean, Sierra Leone is a beautiful, lovely country, and we want to see it stand again. The way this outbreak will end is because people will start changing their behaviours themselves. So in order for communities to do this themselves, they have to be armed with the right information, with facts about Ebola, and that is why the work Media Action is doing in these communities is so important. We know what we do. Sorry, that's becoming a very brief thing. Um, uh, um, so... Here is the upside, but the social and behaviour change communication field has at least partly learned those lessons from HIV and what works in using communication, that a focus on using messages to achieve behaviour change is unlikely to work unless they are rooted in the social, societal and political realities of the people who our efforts are designed to benefit. But unless the communication processes are likely to provoke discussion, dialogue, debate, as it is to foster improved knowledge, it won't lead to action. That communication for behaviour change needs to focus on social, not just behaviour change. After that meeting in Nicaragua, um, there has been a gradual coalescing of organisations focused on improving co uh, communication development with a determination to place the social at the heart of communication thinking. Some of us, for example, formed in 2007 the Consortium for Social and Behaviour Change Communication under the leadership of someone called Denise Gray Felder, who was formerly with the Rockefeller Foundation. And just last month, 1,200 people gathered in Indonesia for the largest ever conference on what was termed social and behaviour change, or what, what was termed the Social and Behaviour Change Communication Conference. It was organised by Johns Hopkins Centre for Communication Programmes, UNICEF, the Seoul City Institute, the Communication Initiative, and ourselves at BBC Media Action. And that conference reaffirmed many of the principles that I've outlined here. It was called the What Works Summit, and what works is understand your audience, develop a clear theory of change, which means understanding the problem you are trying to solve, and developing clear, evidence-based strategies to solve it. Treat people as agents of change, not objects of change. Understand and shift social norms as well as behaviours, and don't ignore the structural issues which prevent behaviour change happening. The character of the conference, I hope, comes through by just some of the keynote speakers. This is what, the, this is what it's called, Shifting Norms, Changing Behaviour, Amplifying Voice, What Works. And these are some of the keynote speakers at it. And actually, a lot of these are presentations and speeches are, are, are available online at sbccsummit.org. But Miguel Savido, for example, on the top right-hand corner, was a kind of pioneer of edutainment, telenovela, educate, um, education. Um, uh, um, movement in Mexico, which led to really substantial reductions in, in um, uh, um, uh, improvements in family planning. David Chiriboga uh, in the middle there at the bottom was a former health minister of Ecuador um, who fundamentally believed communication was vital in his, in, in his whole response to uh, improving public health in Ecuador, particularly, as he called it, that improving health is fundamentally an issue of equity. And unless you make advances in equity, nothing else will happen. Lillian Dubé, um, who's in the, um, who's not on that slide, I don't, oh, no, sorry, in the bottom left, just here, um, who's uh, an actress in um, Seoul City, 
uh, Channing Chang at the Bissara Behavioral Economics Center, Behavioral Economics in Nairobi, Annabel Gaviria, um, who um, is a, a second from the top, top um, on the right hand side, the mayor of Medellin, um, who has fundamentally transformed the crime city of South America into one of the 90% reduction in violent deaths in Medellin by investment in, in public spaces and in public um, public media. Christy Sharma, the artificial intelligence technologist, now this Valji is a senior gender advisor of the UN Executive Office of the Secretary General, and she coordinates the UN EU Spotlight Initiative. So it just gives you a flavor of a kind of reference points for a conversation that the Social and Behavior Change Communication Conference, the biggest conference of its time, was using. But the challenge of integrating these kind of principles into mainstream development programming are really significant. It's not just the usual challenges sort of how to fit such programs into log logical framework metrics and the often short-term project-based parameters of current development funding systems. It's also how do you program communication that reflects these principles at scale? The big challenges of a kind of participatory forms of communication many of us were focused on in the context of HIV is that they are very difficult to scale. So I focused here on the story of HIV, but although this comes from a health issue, many of the le lessons apply across the development arena where obstacles to effective change can be effectively overcome through communication, but where communication can only work when it recognizes it must be focused as much on empowering people as persuading them as seeing them, as I say, as agents of their own change. Let me move in that context to the issue of climate change and adapting to it and provide a practical example. This is a bit, all this kind of scaling up work based on these principles is a lot of what panels, what BBC Media Action seeks to do. Worldwide, we reach more than 200 million people, mostly in fragile states. We work across three areas, improving democratic governance, improving health, and improving resilience and responding to humanitarian disaster. At the heart of our approach is understanding people, their information and communication realities, their social and political conditions and aspirations, and building on, a, uh, and building on that, supporting processes that generate greater efficacy and the capacity for people to shape their own future. I want to show a film now that illustrates this. It's a project we are implementing in Bangladesh on adapting to climate change. Forgive the length of this, this film. I know it's a, it's a keynote speech and it kind of sounds like it's kind of a bit of a get-off just to show a film, um, but um, it's nine minutes long, so please bear with it. Um, uh, and I'll wrap up shortly after that. But the reason I wanted to do this is because it's quite difficult to quickly describe the thinking of research that underpins one, what can feel like a television program or a communication initiative. And as I hope you will see, this initiative, it's called Amri Parry, which means together we can do it, was developed after BBC Media Action carried out the largest ever survey of public understanding on climate change in South Asia. So we interviewed 33,000 people across seven Asian countries. And we worked in consultation with the best experts in Bangladesh to develop an approach that might enable change to happen at scale but which prompted social organization and action at the same time. And it kind of reflects a bit about where we're at on, on trying to utilize some of these principles and adapt them at scale around an issue like climate adaptation. Oh, sorry, I missed all that, never mind. Welcome to Bangladesh. Welcome to Bangladesh. Welcome to Bangladesh. Our country has nearly 160 million people. Pitivit Dilkotam Shomutri Shikot, Abushok to Bodom and Gubun, Amade Deshe Amar Amun Deshe Tali Gotti Varayamanuti. Bangladesh and Mati Ato Valo Je Jakunu Bis, Hele, Oti Sahojehai, Abong Falon Ku Palohai. But every year, tens of thousands of people are forced to leave their homes because of extreme weather. And when you rely on little income, even a small setback can have a huge effect. Amrai Fari means together we can do it. It's encouraging communities to prepare for disaster by working together. It started as a TV show, 
but has evolved into something much bigger. This time last year, Badol's potatoes would have gone to waste because he had no cheap way of storing them out of season. But Amrai Pari gave him the confidence to try this new technique. This is Mo. She follows Amrai Pari on Facebook and shared a music video about what to do in an earthquake. Lippi volunteers for the Bangladesh Red Crescent Society. She holds screenings of Amrai Pari in her community and talks about solutions demonstrated on the show. And this is Jyoti. He's developed a community radio show on disaster preparedness after receiving training from the Amrai Pari team. In 2012, BBC Media Action launched Climate Asia, the world's largest study of people's everyday experience of climate change. I think a lot of the success of the show is that right from the start, it was built on extensive research. Yeah, uh, we asked more than 33,000 people across seven countries in Asia about how climate change is affecting their lives. In Bangladesh, uh, more than 82% people thought that changes in weather are making it more difficult for them to earn money. They are also worried about their health and about their children's future. Whenever we design a new project, we do it with the audience at the heart of our planning. And we ask ourselves questions like, what are the issues that people are struggling with? Who's most affected? Uh, what big changes need to happen? And what small changes can happen along the way? Um, and importantly, how can media and communication help to bring about those changes? And the Climate Asia research gave us a lot of insight into these questions in Bangladesh. The problems that people face in Bangladesh can vary enormously from one place to another. Mojid Ali lives in the north of the country. Every year he's forced to move house because of river erosion and flooding. Shukti Nath lives on Kutubdia Island in the southeast. Increased salinity in the soil is destroying her crops. And Ojit Chondromondol lives in the southwest. He faces regular cyclones and floods. When designing the show, we spoke to hundreds of communities and NGOs and local experts and collected stories of everyday problems. We also found stories that people taking action to adapt with climate change and extreme weather in their own way. But what was missing was a huge megaphone to share stories of simple local solutions and also to inspire others to work together and take action for themselves. In Bangladesh, we know that about 90% of the people have access to television. That is far more than they have access to radio or the internet. And that's why we focus on creating a television show. <laughs> In 2014, Amrai Pari began broadcasting on BTV and later on ATN Bangla. Most of the other people are working on providing information on the problem of climate change. Uh, very few of them are looking at the solutions, and I think Amrai Pari is looking at solutions, not just problems. And I feel it's one of the best programs in the world on raising awareness about the impacts of climate change, and particularly what communities and people themselves can do to tackle the impacts of climate change. Amrai Jai Koshole Bari Ti Toeri Korchi, Shai Koshole Shudhumatra Notun Bari Noi. Puratun Bari O Meramot Kore, Durjok Shonshil Kora Shambhav. Vishesh Kore, Jishabelakai Jhodobatash Beshi, Kimba Ghuni Tar Hai, Shishabelakai, Ei Koshol Gulo Khub Kajar Se. After watching the show, other people began replicating the techniques used in the episode. Pajit Yogan Se, Jehova Ghar Bandhe Shaiba Shikai Se, Aami Eibhabe Aara Bapna Ti Tal Shaibhabe Shab Chhat Kote. Chhat Kere Aara Aami Bish Konishkan Ghar, Aami Eibhabe Nijhata Kori Se, Eibhabe Hadi Kere, the media in Bangladesh is also very male dominated. I think the show has done a good job of amplifying the voice of women and also challenging norms in what is still a very patriarchal society.
রাস্তা করছি খাল কাছি ট্রেনিং এ যাই আইন দেখাই যে তোমাকে তিনশো টাকা মোকো দুইশো টাকা হয়েছে When we spoke to the audience, they liked seeing women take an active role. One woman said that women who contribute economically are better able to make their voices heard. Another told us um, she wanted to start a small poultry farm after watching one of the shows. As many women as men have watched the show, which is unusual for Bangladesh, where you generally find more men watching TV. Staff from 14 radio stations across the country receive training from Amrai Pari producers. They work together to develop shows about disaster preparedness that were relevant to local audiences. also means people without access to TV can see the content. Amrai Pari toolkits containing discussion guides, games, inspiring stories and all of the TV content are being rolled out to community centers across the country. So the TV content can live on even after it's been broadcast. And we know that if people discuss the issues in our show after they have watched it, then they are even more likely to take action as a result. Yeah, I think the program has been excellent. I mean, it's reached a huge number of people and it's clearly influenced what people do, how they um, prepare themselves for a, a wide range of impacts that undermine their resilience. And it seems as though what the program's managed to do is change according to different circumstances. So that matters to us because the context within which we work is always changing. At the end of the second series, more than a third of viewers have taken some action as a result of watching the show. After the third series, that figure had risen to almost half of all viewers. More people in Bangladesh have access to smartphones than ever before, and that's brought with it a new opportunity for Amrai Pari. When we first started making Amrai Pari in 2013, internet access was way down at just less than 8%. By 2015, that had doubled to 16%, and it's now overtaken radio for the first time. And the internet's a great way of engaging young people, particularly at the moment in urban areas. So we're doing a big social media um, series of films at the moment around earthquake preparedness. আর ফেসবুক এমন একটা জিনিস যার মাধ্যমে আমি নিজের প্রাইভেসি অনুযায়ী আমার ইন্টারেস্ট অনুযায়ী আমার ফ্রেন্ডের সাথে কথা বলতে পারি অনেক কিছু যা জানা আছে তা জানতে পারি Amrai Pari is about the stories of people working together to face challenges stories which are inspiring millions of others to do the same We've discovered the unlikely, adapted to the unpredictable, and been delighted by the enthusiasm of partners large and small. But most of all, we've been privileged to learn from those ordinary and extraordinary people all over Bangladesh, we're proving that together we can do it. So I'm sorry that was so long, but it's the, the shorter version, but actually we don't really get a lot of the thinking behind it in the, in, in the shorter version. Um, and I should say, um, you see that 47% figure in the value of them believe it, um, uh, because we found it, I, I'm a director of policy, policy research, and I actually was interested in that figure, that 47% of 22 million people did something different to the result of the, the, the television program or the paper, whatever. But we did ask, and when asking that question, we didn't say, did you do something different? We say, did you do something different? Yes, then what did you do? And then they could go into certain series of categories when it wasn't counted. And this is something we consistently find, particularly when we're talking about resilience or agricultural development projects, that the impact figures are remarkably high, in um, uh, much higher than, for example, on some of the health initiatives we're focused on. I'm running out of time, but I do want to end with some final reflections on 
where this field of social and behavior change communication is now. As you probably can tell, I am, and I think others are haunted still by that experience of HIV, of what happens when communication fails, when it goes wrong, when we don't learn, when it is so vital that people find a way of informing, engaging, and communicating with each other when dialogue between people becomes as important as messaging from people, but we don't actually find a way of implementing that or supporting that at scale. And in this sense, I'm more worried and concerned about our current situation when it comes to information and communication than I have been for many years. I'm by heart an optimist, but I'm finding it difficult to be optimistic at the moment. And indeed, for many years, I was a digital optimist. I started a new program at Panos on the potential of new communication technologies to liberate economic and human potential and achieve development impact. I co-wrote a Panos report 20 years ago uh, called The Internet and Poverty, Real Hope or Real Hype. And it reached an optimistic conclusion. I helped implement in the early 2000s a DFID-funded program with, among others, the Association for Progressive Communication based in South Africa called the Catalyzing Access to Information and Communication Technologies in Africa program. And all this was at Panos, and we attended and spoke at conferences on the huge potential of the internet, mobile telephony, and other ICTs offered development. But about 10 years ago, I have to say, I became a lot less optimistic, increasing the research we were carrying out at BBC Media Action in the kind of fragile states where we work showed how media and communication environments were becoming more fragmented, more fractured, often along political, factional, or other lines, increasingly co-opted and controlled by key interests in society. And this was the case both happening in relation to traditional media and the online space. The room for independent journalism and trustworthy information seemed to be shrinking. The space for rumor, disinformation, and sometimes hate was expanding. We saw how SMS text messages of hate, as well as the manipulation of FM vernacular radio stations during the 2007-08 elections in Kenya were implicated in the terrible violence in the country. We saw how in contexts as various as Afghanistan, Nepal, Iraq, Libya, Kenya, and many of the countries that experienced the Arab uprisings and others, that polities were fragmenting along sectarian or ethno-sectarian lines, often driven, shaped, or supported by these shifts in the information and communication environment. Especially in the last five years, Increasingly, authoritarian governments have become ever more adept at reoccupying and re-seizing control of the information, communication, and civic space. Now, the promise offered us by the digital evangelists, especially from the West Coast narrative of impatient optimism that the digital revolution would lead to more engaged, democratic, transparent, empowered communities, was not materializing in the countries in which we were working. Obviously, there were parts of it that were, but a lot of it was just the opposite. I think these were canaries in the coal mine of what, was now ha what has now happened in supposedly the mature democracies in the West. The Cambridge Analytica scandal, which is implicated in elections in the US and elsewhere, um, uh, and elsewhere in the West, and in Kenya and Nigeria, um, in, and elsewhere in the global South, is where we see these effects most obviously coming together. And the digital optimism in the development world has also often proved unfounded. I believe. Um, many development-funded digital initiatives have failed. And there is increasing evidence that suggests that, not least in the World Bank's 2016 Digital Dividends World Development <coughs> Report, because they have not rooted their approaches in an understanding and, of political and social context, and have failed to develop clear theories of change rooted in that understanding. Too often, initiatives started with technology and sought to find a problem it could solve, rather than really investing in understanding the problem they were trying to solve and then assessing what technology or other strategy might be most effective at addressing it. I have other concerns too. I worry that it is not just big money, big data, and big power that will exploit our new information and communication space. I'm referring there to things like Cambridge Analytica. To manipulate power and manipulate people. I think donors and development agencies may also be seduced once again to seeing people as objects of change. We have a new seed, let's persuade people to use it. We have a new politics, let's persuade people to adopt it. We have a new magic bullet for poverty, let's persuade people to accept it. And with the advances in behavioral science of ubiquitously networked, uh, sorry, and with the advances in behavioral science, a ubiquitously networked world, 
and they're coming to together of different fields of psychology, economics, political economy, and others. That analysis that René Sabatier first outlined, that complex development challenges require social, not just individual change, may now start to break down. But you can actually shift individual behaviors. You can shift social norms. You can get people to think like you want them to think through clever messaging that requires no discussion, no debate, no agency. I welcome the innovation in fields like behavioral economics, for example, but we need to be careful to embed these techniques in learning the lessons of the past. While it may be becoming increasingly possible to use behavioral social science techniques to get inside people's heads, is that the model of human development that is most likely to lead to sustained change in the long term? Which is why the questions I am now asking, and including asking them at the Indonesia Social and Behavior Change Communication Summit, is who decides? Who decides what behaviors need to be changed? Who decides what norms need to be shifted? Who decides what voices need to be amplified? So in conclusion, I believe there is a tissue which connects the HIV experience to climate adaptation, that connects climate adaptation to the politics of elections and beyond. It is the interplay between how humanity communicates with itself, how information is liberated or controlled, how people are enabled or manipulated. If we were to learn the history of development of the last 30 years properly, we would understand much better that would, than we do that the role of information and communication is central to how development happens or fails to happen. And yet these issues of information and communication barely feature in the development discourse. They are barely on the curriculum of development schools and research institutes. And when they are, they are often put into a box called public relations or advocacy or sensitization. I think that needs to change. Information and communication dynamics are shaping and reshaping the political, developmental, and economic realities of this century. They will do so more and more in the future. Much more academic as well as policy attention needs to be paid to them. I know that the University of Reading is one of the very few to pay these issues the heed they deserve. And so I am really grateful to Sarah Cardi and for the, um, uh, and for the Vice Chancellor de Nort for hosting this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating, maybe a, 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 a message. I don't know where it's going to go. I want to say actually it was very nice. Even at nine minutes, the uh, Bangladesh resilience story is is something there that gives us a bit of hope because there has to be some hope yes. otherwise we probably all want to go home, um, <laughs> but not yet. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Okay, I'll have, so we will have the microphone screen now. Um, I haven't worked in development for a decade, but I've thought about communication for development an awful lot since Brexit. Um, and I wondered if I could ask you about your perspective on the UK, on our impoverished national discourse, on our lack of capacity to understand um, people on the other side of the debate and what you might do if you were writing a theory of change for us going forward. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to get a few or do you want to do that uh, one? I don't want to do that one first. I think take this one first because there will be a handful to answer. Um, I, don't, I mean, it's such a difficult question. I mean, it's obviously... It, 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 one thing I want to say is that we are a divided nation and that divided nation has been played out in our new information and communication space, which is substantially fueling and enabling that divide. Um, uh, I think Brexit is, um, I am work for the BBC, so I'm not going to comment too much on, 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 on Brexit itself. Um, as you know, because we work together, um, I, I actually had a conversation with my wife the sort of day after, we, after it happened, and I said, um, I spent 30 years trying to focus on trying to improve the information and communication opportunities available to those who feel economically and politically marginalized. So I'm not going to complain when that's exactly what kind of <coughs> happens. Um, my own view is that this is democracy in action. Um, and democracy is 
actually working. Um, and I think it's a, I think we should not underplay just how important going through this democratic moment, regardless of one's views on either side of it, actually is. I actually, and because I worked for the BBC, or linked to an organisation, I'm mean, cha a charity on the BBC, so I was independent of it. A lot of people criticise the BBC for not shaping the debate in the way that it should be shaped. But it's not the BBC's job to, to referee. It's, a, it's to provide a platform for public debate and try and inform that public debate as much as possible. And I actually would defend the BBC in this context in that I think the debate I think the campaigns, or some of the campaigns were rubbish, but I think the actual platform for public debate was absolutely crucial. And I, I'm going to dodge the question a little bit here, because in terms of the theory of change issue, but I do talk about this elsewhere, because we have so much experience in fragile states, where there are the biggest market failure, the biggest challenge we are currently facing as an organization, and a lot of the countries we're, and actors we talk to within the country we're facing, is where is the space for connecting discourses. The information and communication space is fragmented and fractured. There is nothing providing people with the capacity or uh, space to engage with people who disagree with them, people who are different from them, the, 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 the place where you can actually encounter difference. And all the economic, political, and technological dynamics are moving, reshaping information and communication spaces into this fracturing process, which I think is so dangerous for democracy. And one thing I would say, and I would say this obviously, is that in this country, we have, we have a public service broadcaster and a public service broadcasting system, which at least provides a reasonable capacity for people to actually be exposed to perspectives and views with which they may disagree, and people who are different from them. And I think what's happening here, in that respect, is a great deal of what's happening in the US. That's a very long answer, not a very, and a rather fragmented one. But that's my Brexit answer, and I could, I'll, I'll have a coffee and sit, or, or a beer or a wine, I'll give you my own views. <laughs> so that's, I think that's not in mind, the idea of Brexit being a democracy in action. I've got a question here from well, Thank you very much. <clears throat> You're speaking very much about behavioural change in terms of two areas, HIV and then climate change and adaptation. But there's a very big question of behavioural change, and you think one that's very current is obesity, where you're looking for a behavioural change, and there seems to be a struggle there. It's how much do you think could be uh, learned from people, and then these bogeymen, and I'm pointing the finger directly at the people like Coca-Cola, Starbucks, McDonald's, they seem to be able to bring about behavioural change in worldwide. What techniques are they using that could be adapted on things like obesity or the subject you've mentioned? Um, so I think if this slightly talks to the end of the lecture, I was, uh, where I think the techniques for achieving behavioural change are becoming far more sophisticated and the capacity for big commercial or other actors to get people to do what they want to do, um, consume the products they want them to consume, are becoming ever more powerful. Um, and I think it's not well understood and it's not well scrutinised. I think one of the challenges facing the development system is how much they do the same kind of marketing, the same kind of exploitation of new advances in behavioral science. I think it's a, I think it's a massive debate which isn't really happening at the moment, um, and I think it needs to. I, I can't talk on obesity because uh, in terms of its potential, in terms of what's going to work, because this is exactly what I don't know because we haven't done the research to really look at what the drivers are, what the social and political, so it's not one of the areas we've worked on with mean, thinking about it. So I'm not going to comment on that, because I'm, I'm basically... Well, indeed, so, it, so in terms of, there are bigger structural issues within, uh, within society which absolutely need to be addressed at the same time. It's quite a very uh, simple phrase, we're looking for tough love. My tough love is your... 
Yeah, 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 and a lot of, you know, what good communication can do is, is, is confront people with unpalatable and uncomfortable realities. Um, um, it's the way in which, the creative way in which you can do that, which is, is the big challenge. A lot of what we do is, is not, is, is some of, a lot of what we do is really difficult. Um, it's, it's, it's saying things that are unpopular to people, and that's, that's, that's a key challenge. Yeah. So you gave a number of examples which were really powerful um, where you'd instigated behavioural change at what I might call grassroots level. Are we now in a situation where we're seeing that change is being affected there? But for example, we still have at least one world leader that doesn't necessarily believe in climate change. And I suppose the question is twofold. How do we affect communication this way? Is there now a disjoint between leadership and the people that they seek to represent? And do we need different types of communication to impact change within that kind of leadership? Yes, but I think the, the I think this is one of the reasons I'm so worried is that the space for people to collectively come together. There's lots of advocacy movements, but the space for people on different sides of political divides who to to actually come together and and, and engage with each other and connect with each other, I think are disappearing quite fast. So I think we're going to see a lot of, in, in response to, um, uh, to Trump and, and, and populism and so on, so we'll see a lot of advocacy. But the key, I think, one of the key challenges for that advocacy is who are they actually engaging? Um, are, are they actually engaging people who think like them? Or how much are they actually going to engage across the divides with people who don't think like them? So I think this is our fundamental, you know, different kind of tragedy of a commons, I suppose, but the common information and communication space does not enable this sort of thing to come to, to, to this kind of action, to this connected action to come. And it, it is a slightly different kind of take on this, but we're looking quite a lot about the whole process of, because we work a lot in fragile states, actually what, and, you know, what is a fragile state? And a lot of it's about the capacity of government to deliver services for people and the rule, establish the rule of law and have a monopoly over violence and security and so on. But it's also fundamentally about identity. Paul Collier talks about this, about the fundamental challenge of shared identity in countries. Um, uh, um, the, the state building project has, has failed because it has focused too much on shared interests and not enough on shared identity, says Collier. And I actually buy into that quite a lot. Um, but actually, if you look at and with the research we've done in, in, in a country like Afghanistan or Nepal or many others where actually how are people meant to create a sense of shared identity? Um, around what do they create that? I mean, what's the mechanism for them engaging with each other, first of all, to find what they share in common, what their common reference points are? What does a nation mean, actually? How do you build a nation from the bottom up? I think that I think really do think the days of what top-down New Area style, Sahara style nation building, maybe early going to proving me wrong, but I, th I think that's wrong. Um, I, I don't think that's going to work any longer in the, in, the, in the information and communication reality. Shared polities, shared identities, shared nationhood needs to be built up from the bottom. But we don't have the tools. We don't have the mechanisms. We don't have the information and communication spaces that enable that connection to happen. And that's one of the biggest worries I've got. I think that's a market failure issue. And it's something that, that we're not really invested in solving. Not, sorry, it's a very tangential answer. But There's a lot of spaces now where people can make their views hurt, but not so many where they actually have dialogue. Precisely. Thank you. That's a much better answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I'm sure there will be some time after this when we're open to ask some further questions. But the final question is for Pat. Um, I don't quite share your pessimism for technology, though I agree with many of the points that, you, that you've raised. I see it as having a potential to dramatically empower people, and I've seen that particularly in the developing world with women, who for the first time have access to a device where they can find out their own information and they can share information with their, their peers. So. Um, but what I, have, what I share your pessimism for is the fact that people don't understand how to use that technology. And even in this country, we're not training people 
of how to get the most out of it and how to protect people from misinformation and fake news, etc. I just wonder what your point of view is on that. I, I, couldn't, I, mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's not as if this is all dark and gloomy. I mean, there's you know, wonderful social movements, Me Too, and uh, there's wonderful social movements emerging, the new spaces, of, the, 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 the occupation of, of, of new spaces online, the creation of new identities of power empowerment um, uh, is fantastic. And that's one of the reasons I got so excited about this 20 years ago, is that that's what, you know, it was, that, that, that there, was, there was such opportunity for empowerment and create, particularly those creation of spaces which formal institutions don't disable. And, and, and I, I think there is, it is it, 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 you're absolutely right. I think the, the problem is that I think the, it, the, the kind of balance of the glass half full, half empty for me has shifted a bit. Is that rumor, misinformation, disinformation? The, the, it is becoming so easy to subvert the information and communication space to political, factional, commercial um, <coughs> ends, ultimately, fundamentally undemocratic ends. But, uh, but democracy, which also needs to nurture those spaces, is really eroding. Um, and I think we've seen this a lot in a, in, for a lot longer time in some of the more fragile states than we have perhaps um, where we're just catching up with this in the West. So um, I, I, tr I struggle, I try to be optimistic. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really struggling at the moment because I think it's so, it, it's, it's uh, and, but I think one of the spaces for optimism is that I think one of the, personally, one of the, this is my own view, not, not BBC Media Action's view, but I think this kind of digital evangelism, but this West Coast narrative has kind of straightjacketed our ability to really understand or scrutinize what's been going on and to really have an intelligent debate because anyone who disagreed with it was seen as being a Luddite, as not getting with a program, um, uh, not, under, not being a disruptor, and so on and so forth. And I think now that we've the events of the last year or two have got us into a different space where we can actually have a much more um, intelligible debate about what the advantages and disadvantages and what the intelligent policy options available to us are going forward around using or not using the information communication technology. But I am so tired of being in a development field where uh, you know, if your proposal had to have some kind of app or whatever. We, we you know, we had to, there was a proposal we saw uh, for a program in South Sudan which had to have a digital app attached to it. Well, it's not a sensible thing to do in South Sudan, um, uh, where access to radio is really strong, but access to digital technologies is not, it will be soon. It, 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 you know, but, but so many projects you can see are going to fail because they are tech first and not haven't done the development analysis. And so I, I'm, I agree with you. It's another long, wordy answer to something which is <laughs> much shorter. But, um, uh, but I think, I, I don't think it, we should kid ourselves. I don't, I'm not, anyway, I, 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 there's no point pretending to be optimistic when one isn't, and I find it very difficult to be optimistic at the moment when it comes to this space. It makes it even more important to study it, and it makes it more <laughs> important to focus on it, and it makes it more important that the University of Reading continues to prioritise it, Vice Chancellor, and it, more <laughs> <laughs> and it makes it more um, important that this moves much more centre stage to the development discourse because it really isn't at the moment and it needs to be. Okay, once again, my thanks. I do want to give the last word to Sarah Gunn, who organised. I want to thank you for to a few people. Thank you for coming and and sharing and hosting evening for us. I want to thank James. Um, I got to be a bit self-indulgent because um, I've heard James talk many times over the years and I know that he's both interesting, can be a bit provocative and will be fairly straightforward about exactly what he thinks. So I have really enjoyed hearing this, um, hearing this talk and I wanted to thank all of you it's been, it's really lovely to look out and to see such a diverse group of people in the room. Um, the the postgraduates, our postgraduate and undergraduate alumni in the school come from an enormous range of places. And we've been wanting to 
reach out more concretely and um, and engage and make it clear this is a community and so it's lovely to see some people who graduated not so long ago, some people who graduated longer, but who still have an interest in the kinds of discussions that are going on. So this is part of the reason why this is an inaugural lecture. We want to be hosting one every year with a different speaker on a different topic of interest to in international development um, and in agricultural economics, anything that revolves around the Guinea community. Even if I know some of you were studying and it was a different name entirely, um, I was thrilled to see some people who had studied extension and, and such showing up as, as having registered to come, so welcome. Um, if you obviously, if you have any suggestions for things you'd like us to, to be talking about, let us know. Um, I'm very happy to have emails and to, to hear from you. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm sure we've got a good audience online who are live streaming. So we recognize that the vast majority of our alumni are not UK based or aren't in the Reading area. So we wanted to make sure this is accessible to everybody. So if there's a bit you want to show or discuss again, you're going to be able to watch it through our Facebook page and through the Gide website in the future. And if you did find it interesting, do feel free to get other people to have a to have a look. Um, we've got uh, a nice wine reception for you, so please have join us, have uh, a drink, have a talk with other people. Certainly, there are some current students in the room who can find out what life is looking like now. Um, and we'd love to hear what you have to think. So thank you very, very much for coming and for making this a really lovely evening. Thank you.